Hello and welcome to day 158 of 365 Days Towards Racial Change. My name is Thomas Nyback and we're here talking about black issues in America. Some of the some of the fundamentals of, uh, of black existence, white existence in America. Ooh, excuse me. Every color and shade in between. Trust me, I am interested in this topic. <laughs> Um, two major thoughts emerge as I continue this project. First thought is for the black mind, black conditioning possibly in America. Are blacks still living uh, as though they are slaves? Are they still uh, mentally under uh, the rules of slave master? Or are blacks still living out a, a slavery dynamic here in America? Um, second side of the same coin is the white mind of privilege, their attitudes, um, the ease of movement in a white system, system created by whites, for whites, administered by whites. Um, do they have or feel any true obligation towards non-white people of the world. And the second big thought is for financial literacy, for black people to get their head around uh, bigger financial terms. Our access uh, to language and terms may give us a better chance at elevating ourselves and prospering here in America for the general population of blacks and see a resurgence of our numbers. Uh, we are so beaten back, you know, the, the Native Americans were physically and brutally uh, beaten back uh, to a space in America that put them uh, generations behind, although you, you see them coming back in little subtle ways. Uh, black folks have kind of gone undergone a period of attrition <laughs> and uh, it's slow, arduous for all sides, all parties involved, but I think that's happening. But financial literacy will, will be a big piece in getting black folks to turn that momentum, you know, at least if we can cease uh, the onslaught, the attack on us. And, it, it, you know, I'm using these big terms you know, they probably would have been more appropriate for the 60s. But nevertheless, I think they're still relevant. They've been relevant in my life. You know, uh, I'm not uh, outwardly discriminated against. But I can show you situation after situation where my blackness has been a detriment to moving successfully in American society. Uh, you'll see behind me, uh, well, first let's talk about my motivation. I'm motivated by a man named Dr. Claude Anderson, read three of his works, a lot, watched a lot of his YouTube videos. I believe I get it. Uh, maybe I might not be a hundred percent on board. I don't want to just be a carbon copy of Dr. Claude Anderson. Uh, there are some points, um, that I wish he would elaborate on. Maybe he has. I just haven't done enough research into his works. But the three books I got were, I think, well enough to get us on the way. And we use this material to get us through this year. First book I read, if there's no book you get, or if you only get one resource of his, get this one. This is a good cross-section of history, attitudes, uh, labor, wealth, all everything. 101 questions. You never thought to ask so a black history reader, get that book first and um, we'll give it a go. Uh, if I may make it, uh, I may buy it for you if, uh, if you have issues. Just try to contact me. Maybe I'm not making a promise. Maybe we can set something up for you to get that excellent resource. Black Labor, White Wealth, Search for Power economic justice and Dr. Anderson's national plan to empower black America. 
poweronomics. You can find Dr. Anderson at poweronomics.com and the Heritage Institute in Washington, D.C. Again, I'm Tomlin's Nyback. I know I'm talking a lot. Big, big plug for Dr. Anderson, but his work is valid. It's brought a, a lot of peace <laughs> to my life. He's articulated uh, things I was experiencing, but again, the language, he put a language to it, and I was able to absorb it, uh, wrap my head around his, his affirmations of my experience, and now I'm uh, in other places here in America and in my mind and my spirit. Behind me is the hashtag us two symbol. You'll find black women supporting one another there. A lot of issues. I've not visited there in a while, but I, I know it's there. They're on Facebook. Check out Black Enough, B-L-A-G-G-E-N-U-F. Kind of a black Facebook. More Facebook ideas. Uh, interesting. Facebook is synonymous with uh, defining social media. If you want social media, you Define it against the giant Facebook. Oh, if you're here on the World Wide Web, you can find your community. If you can't, do what I did, start my own. A lot of, we want a lot of angles and ish, uh, uh, you know, approaches uh, to this very important issue. Uh, especially uh, for black folks. And finally, story time. We're getting back to story time. You're going to see this more frequently. We've got a little ways to go. In Uncle Tom's Cabin, Harriet Beecher Stowe's phenomenal work, and we want to stay up to date and keep going. We definitely want to finish that by the end of the year. I'm not sure if we'll get through all of these texts. I intend on getting at least through Uncle Tom's Cabin and 101 Questions, uh, the Black History Reader. Before the end of the year, we'll see. I've got school coming up. I'm finally in a space where I can uh, finish my bachelor's degree in philosophy. Uh, I could use your support and prayers for that. And... Uh, so here we go, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin. It kind of be, might be a short piece, I don't know. I've been, been parsing the chapters, splitting them up. Uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe is a great uh, writer, really gives us a good foundation, complicated characters in the story, and she's continuing. Last chapter, we saw Tom kind of introduced uh, to his new slave masters, St. Clair, uh, St. Clair, it, well, we call him St. Clair. His surname is St. Clair. His name is Augustine. He's the master of the plantation, but everybody calls him St. Clair. Then you have uh, his wife, Marie, his daughter, Eva. That's the little girl uh, that Tom pulled out of the water. And now he's arrived on back on his plantation with Ophelia, his cousin, who's going to uh, care for Eva, be around, be, be a, uh, a stabilizing factor in, uh, in the home. Uh, Marie is narcissist. She's a narcissist. She's very dysfunctional, self-centered, ice cold. Uh, you know, <laughs> St. Clair would not have married this woman had he... Uh, slowed down a bit, a little more circumspect in his uh, in his uh, search for a mate. But uh, remember, he, he did have the ideal wife, but uh, she was under the care of some people up north. They interceded, intercepted, and screwed up a lot of that. But, you know, some of the things, maybe this little Eva, um, could not come into the world but through the union of St. Clair and Marie. We, we see uh, sometimes how some of the, the worst-looking um, circumstances can turn out for the good. 
I know for the longest time I was uh, I had trouble when my parents divorced. Um, I was a critical age in my life and, and whatnot. But hindsight, yes, it was the best thing for these two individuals to separate. Um, in li- you know, even in light of uh, the children that they shared with one another. Um, the, uh, different wisdom works in the universe, this overarching. And we see Harriet Beecher Stowe exercising that same uh, privilege. It's her work. You know? I do it in my writing, too. I'm a bit of a writer, so uh, I do that often with my characters. Um, you interject some drama. It's what the stories are driven on and um, lives are changed and some make out well, some suffer. So St. Clair has married Marie, produced Eva, and Eva's a bright shining light in St. Clair's life. He dotes on her, the only child. Marie was the only child whose father doted on her, but she's very... um, jealous of her daughters um her daughter receiving that affection and you know she lays around she complains uh, marie lays around complains about headaches and all this stuff all the time it's very sad (laughs) development there on marie chapter 16 opens up with marie and saint Clair at breakfast and Marie's complaining and stuff, she's not getting attention and all that. Uh, but the conversation, Harriet Beecher Stowe is putting more um, meat on the bones of, the, of Marie's character. We find uh, some interesting um, uh, ways of thinking in Marie. And Marie is like... Um, She's like, I would guess, many white folks, especially in the South, the slave uh, South versus the free North. But don't don't get too polarized about attitudes of blacks being different. The attitudes of bla- uh, towards blacks, I should say, being different between North and South. They're maybe free in the North, but they're... <sighs> Blacks are in the, on the inside, so to speak. Uh, actually, you know, I have we have I talk about some ups and downs with Dr. Martin Luther King, but when the civil rights movement went to Chicago, uh, they found the, uh, uh, the the opposition opposition was so violent <laughs> that he uh, he said the South should come up north here to learn how to hate <laughs> is what. He encountered in the north, so I don't know. You're, I don't know. You could be free and despised, or be a slave and despised. <laughs> you know, uh, both spaces in the United States had some overarching generalizations towards black people. Uh, so, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about the slave South here since they're in Louisiana. Marie's grown up with uh, black slave servants and things like that. And her mind is as though, like, as though she's treating the slaves the way we treat our domestic animals. You know, we're doing them a favor. We're, we're neutering them and spading them and controlling them and their population and all this stuff. That's that's the attitude of Marie towards black people, the black slaves. Now, especially under her care, she came with kind of a dowry of uh, black slaves. And we'll get to Mammy. Mammy is her personal kind of servant, a mulatto female. Uh, but Mar- Marie's mind is a good page and a half of how she is overwhelmed by taking care of the slaves and keeping them slaves. And uh, there's no mention of, well, it, when it's mentioned, to let them go, free them. Uh, she uh, 
uh, digs in deeper to her conviction that um, keeping the slaves is uh, an altruistic expression of her heart and her nature and things like that. And she's very, she has a deep conviction that she's doing black people a favor by keeping them. Now, I want to be her devil's advocate for a moment and say something because, uh, you know, I just, uh, like I'm going through a metamorphosis as I continue the project. And in a way, she is right. Uh, because the America then and now, it's a white system created by whites, for whites, administered by whites. You know, uh, they uh, control who gets what, how, and when, and they go through all kinds of politics, rhetoric, and all this uh, commotion, and uh, I think a lot of activity to keep people, so people have a job. You know, so it looks like the politician is doing something, right, and arguing, you know, <laughs> when there, there's, a, my mind, maybe I need to work on this, is like, you, you're just doing stuff to keep a job. It's like uh, my feelings about some of this research and development with the internet. They're always updating and changing this, and that, but, but they're really not brought any substance uh, to the product <laughs> you know just people you know are wearing an R&D hat or a development hat and they they better keep bringing up new stuff listen a black and white commercial can on TV is going to sell me or not the same product whether it's cult uh, has colors bells whistles and drama you know <laughs> I, I uh, very bare bones, hence a philosophy degree. We don't, in general, we don't care about all that pomp and circumstance. You know, what is the issue? So, uh, you know, Marie is right on some some level. Uh, I agree even with her. Uh, if you kidnap me or sell me somewhere. You know, I'm going to be at the mercy and uh, I'm going to be grateful for whatever what benevolence you need. You know. <laughs> like the Greeks, uh, Spartans, you know, used to take their babies and for inspection. If the baby was, you know, out, out, not didn't appear up to par, this guy threw him off and knew the trash he exposed. <laughs> you know, we don't want that. Uh, so, you know, Marie in a way right you know, we don't let the animals run loose we'd have roadkill all over the place and wild animals roaming the neighborhood okay but that's that's as far as I can go with it you know because uh, <laughs> slavery American slavery especially I think is just so brutal I can't comment on other lands I just I know uh, enough I didn't experience it as my ancestors did, but American slavery is brutal, brutal and way over the top. Okay, so that's that's Marie's mind. Oh, we're no, we can't. We gotta keep the black people. We're doing them a favor. They'd be exposed if we let them free. Now, interestingly enough, part of this conversation happens in the presence of Ophelia from the Free North. And, you know, Ophelia, you know, she kind of, she mentions, she doesn't press, uh, but the, she's disturbed. Being in the free north, she has a different attitude. You know, maybe the blacks aren't all in to Ophelia's life, but she does have some empathy and sympathy for uh, how they're treated. And so she's very, she interjects, oh, they need education and, and uh a hand up, you know, some assistance to participate in the white system. You know, uh, Marie dismisses any of that kind of uh, rhetoric. Uh, she dismisses that from her mind. 
completely. Um, uh, Marie's example is uh, her personal maid, uh, the mulatto female uh, slave named uh, Mammy. Mammy uh, has all uh, has always been Marie's personal servant, kind of a gift from Marie's father. And uh, Eva, I mean uh, Marie, complains that <sighs> Mammy's unappreciative, lazy, sleeps too much. Is uppity, um, high strung, undisciplined, all these things, you know, because uh, she's not measuring up uh, specifically to Marie's um, ideas of, you know, because Marie is, she's on steroids, she's narcissism on steroids, right? Everything, everyone around her needs to be. Uh, open her eyes wide if she passes gas or something, that, that type of thing. She gets off on that. Uh, but we find out in the text, you know, Marie had to leave her husband back on the original plantation. I'm sorry, Mammy had to leave her husband on the plantation of her father because uh, Mammy's husband was a blacksmith. They couldn't they didn't want to get any labor. That was very, it's a very valuable slave there to handle uh, equipment, machinery, uh, probably handled numbers, could probably read, was literate. You know, on my job, I have a kind of a skill, you know, I can back trailers. Um, it's, it's easy to learn. It's nothing to me, but I can do it. And it's just I go on, it's like on automatic. So I, I'm kind of a value, I don't get paid, I don't get compensated for that, but I'm valued to a degree <laughs> for that. Uh, not, uh, you know, so Mammy's husband had to stay. Also, Marie didn't take, bring Man Mammy's two children with her. This, this is something we consistently see through the text, the separation of families. Now, they're not animals. You know, our domestic animals, they may uh, get over being separated from uh, their litters and mothers and fathers and things like that. Not so with humans. Humans have a deeper value of family. I may, animals may be too. You know, I'm, I'm, I put in the brief notes that maybe one day we will uh, break the code for um, animal language, and boy, will will we get a story somehow? Uh, uh, Eva is still there. She's around. She's listening to this conversation, and Eva is a little bit empathic, and she likes to. Uh, have some uh, interest in the slaves, and she has uh, some empathy when she sees people at hard at work and everything. And so she really, uh, this comes out, and she uh, offers to intercede for Mammy in her, um, in Mammy's distress, and in Marie's distress over. Uh, Mammy's apathy and whatnot, and this uh, spills over into Marie, you know, dismissing Eva's concern. Uh, Ophelia is still watching this. She's the observer in this scene, quite, uh, uh, quite present, you know, trying to, in her little ways to make some alleviation to the suffering of Eva. Marie St. Clair, she's, she's a bit of, um, you know, codependent, you know, um, she absorbs a lot of this dysfunction going on in the family. So she's actually perfect for uh, what's going on there in on the plantation <laughs> in Louisiana. St. Clair, he has left the room, he's back, and... Uh, the tension between him and Marie is apparent, and it's uh, the tension is broken with the they hear laughter 
outside and the St. Clair opens the veranda to see Eva with Tom and they're, they're, Eva and Tom are enjoying one another. The little white girl and the older black man. So we're going to leave it there. We're going to find out what, what happens, what's going on. Uh, uh, tune in tomorrow and find out. Uh, so we got more foundation. I've read ahead. So um, these points, uh, Marie's narcissism, uh, Ophelia's codependency, Eva's empathy, uh, St. Clair's aloofness. These are going to be important factors. Uh, just to tease you a little bit in uh, going forward in Uncle Tom's cabin. I'm Tom with Nyback. Thank you for hanging out with me in day 158 of 365 days towards racial change. I'll see you tomorrow.